Welcome to the Finder of Lost Things, exploring your superpowers of trust, healing, and transformation with me, Hannah Belton. My brother, Christian, disappeared in Mali, Africa in 2003. He disappeared without a trace. We lost his story. We didn't have closure. We lost so much. I was fighting and searching to find Christian when actually I just needed to sit in stillness and attract him in. I was so resistant to doing this, but I had to surrender. It's a process of trusting and finding the lost pieces and, and integrating them. And this podcast will uncover the process that Christian and I went on to find the lost things, him, and to find the parts of me that were missing. And we were destined from the start to tell our story into the dark. For we were born to a great white shark. Hello, hi, welcome. Come on in as usual. Come on into the circle. Um, I can't believe I'm saying it, but this is our penultimate episode as a finder of lost things. I can't believe it. Um, I'm, yeah, I'm kind of feeling, a, I'm beginning to feel a little bit lost is not quite the right word, but I'm feeling, a, I'm sort of having to let go of this last six months of, uh, I've, I've enjoyed it so much and I'm just beginning to let it go in this episode, I think probably before we do our final episode. But I have an amazing guest to share with you today and I'm so happy that she agreed to come on the show. Um, I think it's going to be really uplifting. I think if you are recently bereaved or you are facing um, a, a death of a, of a loved one or you yourself are facing your own death, um, I think we're going to have a really... Uh, inspiring insightful and empowering and beautiful conversation today um my guest is louise adams i'm gonna let her introduce herself as to her sort of qualifications for being on the show really um but i um i don't even know which episode it was it was quite early on but i was talking about chris's experiences of the afterlife and uh, and his death um, which I need to say he was unconscious and he was in the water. Um, <coughs> pardon me. And I, at that time said, it would be wonderful. I'd really love to speak to a death doula, somebody who has sat with patients maybe, or somebody who's sat with people who are dying and they know the sort of dying process and, um you know to have somebody on who could really bring comfort and and I suppose explain a little bit for me as well what Chris might have experienced um so in less than a few months <laughs> Louise Adams who is I would call her a death doula and I know she has been called a death doula before but uh she magically appeared in my life and I just thought I can't not ask her to come on the show <laughs> So I did, and she has. So I'm going to welcome Louise now. Hi, Louise. I know Hi, Louise is from Wales, the land of the dragon. <laughs> so hi, thank you so much for joining me. Honestly, my heart is, I'm so pleased you're here, and I feel that this episode is much needed. Um, so yeah, do you want to just give a little introduction to yourself, your sort of background and, and why you're on the come to be on the podcast <laughs> absolutely hi Hannah so um as Hannah said my name is Louise Adams um and what a what a gift to be invited here by Hannah and what a, a divine gift from her brother I'm sure that he's connected us both and I'm absolutely sure that he's done that so um you know a big nod to him as well for inviting me here to share absolutely. this beautiful space you know because um they they don't leave they don't leave mm. and um, and that's what I'm hopefully here to share with you all and, and to lift you all out of that 
the, the, the immense sort of grief and sadness that we feel when we're earthbound. Um, so as Hannah said, you know, we've, we've been gifted with the opportunity to meet um, in this life, which is, which is simply beautiful and, and what a beautiful synchronicity. Um, and, and whether when Hannah said, you know, I've been looking for a death doula and I was like, oh, here I am. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I've, um, I'm from the land of the dragons. So uh, Wales in the UK, um, where we were all <laughs> beautiful Welsh energy to, to sprinkle in here today. Um, and so my experience of working in end of life care is has been a simply beautiful journey and again another synchronous uh, another synchronicity journey as well of how I got there um so I've been working for our NHS which is our healthcare in the UK um as an NHS paid therapist which is incredibly rare um to be an NHS therapist so we are a rare breed and I'm you know I'm certainly glad to have been part of this so I walked into our cancer hospital I was a Reiki master teacher and healer with already uh, some years of experience behind me and felt a calling to walk into my local NHS cancer hospital and ask if, if I could be a service. Um, and it was a leap of faith and it's, it's without a doubt one of the greatest leap of faiths I've ever made. And it's brought me to a place of, you know, incredible privilege of being able to sit with people at the end of their life. Um, for the last 18 years so it's you know I, I have to pinch myself sometimes and think of how long that's been so I've worked with adults with cancer on their journey um, from diagnosis to end of life um, I've also worked with the families and the relatives who were left behind so I work uh, a lot with them with the healing process and working through their grief and, and sort of helping them back into the world of the living because they still have to stay earthbound um, and I also work with teenagers um, ending their life with cancer as well. So, you know, uh, as I said, a, a huge privilege to, to hold people's hands and, and hold their energies as they transition into the next part of their journey. So, yes, yeah, so yeah. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you. Oh, so there's a couple of things in there that I sort of thought, oh, that's interesting. Like having that calling, what kind of prompted you to go into the hospital? Was there something did you get a yeah. message did you get a what, what happened do you know what actually this was this was kind of a brush with a near death myself so I was um I was a civil servant and in my civil service job I was threatened with a gun and in Ooh. that moment yeah in that Ooh. moment Sorry. I faced yeah I faced a feeling of wow that that could be me um, and I naturally went on the sick from that role. And it was while whilst I was on the sick from that role that I was seeking to use my healing because as a healer with no purpose, that's just not right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was it was just a feeling, it was a calling, it was a it was a dream. Um, I meditate, I meditate daily, and in my meditation, I was shown a cancer hospital. So it was just as much a shock to me <laughs> oh. as it was to the people that I walked into that day and, and literally walked in and said, I'd, I'd like to be of service. I'm a healer. I teach Reiki. Um, I'd like to work with you. Is that okay? And, and I walked in and, that was, and I never left for 18 years. Oh my goodness. That is amazing. I, my whole body, the minute you said that was, is tingling so much. I can't believe there's so many, like a healer without purpose. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And that, and that, ta and t like taking that leap of faith, like you just said, like yeah. you could have just ignored that, couldn't you? Oh, of course I could. I, I mean, I was a lone parent, you know, I, I had a daughter to feed. I had a, a you know, a, a home to support and there I was with, with no purpose and, and I was being paid because I was on the sick, but that wasn't enough. That really wasn't enough. Um, so it, it was certainly a calling and without a doubt the loudest calling I've ever had <laughs> oh that's beautiful. so beautiful and then that that your brush with death do you think that uh, the, the when you said that I really got the bodily chills from that do you still yeah. does that still sort of affect you now I still I still have the memories of it so I I had to have counseling after that time because I, I developed PTSD 
which was a huge shock to me because I thought PTSD was for people that were in the war, that had returned from, you know, combat. And to realize that I was in a process of PTSD myself, I think that was the tool that I then ran with as the healer in the cancer hospital. Because what I recognized very early was that patients or the relatives develop PTSD because they're saying goodbye to their loved ones. And I really honestly believe that I was meant to have experienced this to deepen my work as a healer of service to others. And it's, it's been where I've been ever since. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I mean, that's similar to me. I mean, that's why I do what I do now. And in fact, if Christian hadn't gone missing and what have you, none of this would be happening at all. Absolutely. So when you say that, maybe well, I, I should talk about it now, just because you've mentioned it, the yeah. the trauma response because I held my sort of trauma in in hugely and it was actually the last thing that I was prompted to release yeah um so how how did it manifest in yourself so for me at the time it was it was actually very subtle my mine appeared in the physical body because as a as a healer I think I'm so used to processing my own hurt so quickly because that's as a healer we're taught to do that so because I heal mentally and emotionally very quickly my my system had to resonate with that somewhere so I developed physical symptoms so I became physically poorly and I remember my doctor who knew me very very well he knew that I was a very sort of um very capable healer if you like you know, and, and he always said to me, you know, if there's anyone I'll never treat for stress, it'll be you because you're so resilient. And there I was with all these physical symptoms. So severe headaches, nausea, um, you know, sort of um, what do they call it um, when you're looking around for danger? So you become hypervigilance. Yeah, hypervigilance. I developed this hypervigilance. And I remember sitting in my doctor's surgery and he said, um, has anything happened to you recently? And I was like, I don't think so. You know, I, you know, I had a divorce a couple of years ago and that was fine because that was meant to be. And I'm a lone parent. And he said, anything else? And I sort of said, well, I, I was threatened with a gun about six months ago. And he was like, stop, stop, <sighs> talk, talk to me. And I read it like a story because I processed it. And there it was. And he said, and there it is. So I had a physical manifestation of it. And I now recognize that in me. But more importantly, I recognize it in others. So when I'm working with, with the relatives that are left behind, as the healer, I work with them to, to release this grief and trauma. Um, and that's what I've become known for. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it, there's so many layers to grief, isn't there? And, huge, huge. Uh, and holding it, like holding it in the body is um, it's so painful. So damaging. Yeah. It is. And that's what I did. You know, I wasn't aware that I was holding it in. I think I was just aware that as a lone parent, I had to get on with it. And I know a lot of our relatives say that to me. I have to get on with it. I still have to be a mum or a dad or, a, or you know, an, an uncle or an auntie. They still have to have a life. Um, I recognise that. You know, and, and that's where I can step in with my therapies and, and my healing and say, right, let's take you out of that journey of pain um you know to yeah. that, that that full healing yeah because I mean I, I've had clients who well so many people they experienced uh, a bereavement but at the time they just couldn't grieve you know yes. they were they yes. they had to go back to work they had a family you know they Absolutely. were the strong one in the family so they couldn't Absolutely. be seen to grieve and yeah. it comes out like COVID's been great for that you know <laughs> yes. it comes out years decades later it, uh, it really does. And that's, and that's what I see time and time again, you know, so I will often say to people, just let it out. You know, I, you know, in the Western world, if you like, we are so, we are so inept at grief. We're not taught to grieve. You know, we, we are as a society, you know, certainly in Britain, you know, we've got the stiff upper lip, you know, onwards and upwards, you know, we've even got these ridiculous memes, keep calm and carry on. You know, they're sold everywhere, you know, and you have these, in, you know, you have these subliminal messages, keep calm and carry on. What does that even mean? <laughs> that means keep calm, hold it in, don't you dare grieve. So for me as the healer, I'm consciously aware of that all the time. 
and sort of telling people through the language patterns that we we see don't keep it in do not hold your grief in you know be like the other cultures that wail wail and grieve and shout and scream and and get it out but we're not conditioned we're really not conditioned to be that way no we'll talk about about that a bit later on um the other thing i just wanted to pick up from your intro you've worked with lots of different ages of yeah. patient yes the, the question that came into my head was i mean i know christian was young he was 27 mm. when he died when he passed on over whatever yeah. the term is but <laughs> Are there differences in the attitude towards death between the ages? Because you've obviously worked with teenagers, like, um, yeah, is it huge. is it that a huge yeah. subject, or can you give me it's, a sort of rough it's idea? Huge, yeah, it's a huge subject, but I can praise it down into again the expectations and life that that happens as an adult. You know, we've got mortgages, we've got families, we've got people to leave behind. You know, um, an adult when they're when they're passing away is consciously you sort of working with their family. How is this going to work and how is that going to work and blah, blah, blah. A child going through death is just it, it sounds really strange thing to say, but one of the most beautiful things to see because children don't hold on like adults do. Mm. And for me, that has been one of the most beautiful gifts in my time in end of life care is the, the teenagers, the young people that die, they don't hold on so much. They, their, their body is newer, so the body is newer, and I think that's something to do with it. But I think that acceptance, that they know there's, they, they're closer to the beautiful place they came from, that's what it feels like to me. So when I think about children, and I, you know, my heart goes out to people who grieve for children, for me, the children are the safest in all of this they are the ones that transition into their near past they're closer to where they came from so for me i've 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 sat with with children as they've died and it's the most beautiful experience um and i know that sounds such a strange thing to say because i've got one ear on the parents you know i've got one ear at, at sometimes listening to their grief but i'm also holding the space of the child who's so almost oh how do I say this without you know making this sound wrong but almost excited to to go back to that beautiful place of freedom from a body that no longer works you know because they're back with their soul they're back with the soul without a broken body and they understand that more than adults do hmm. so it's yeah it's very different oh that's amazing I hadn't ever thought about it like that but yeah, that's I, that's so so true so true yeah, amazing absolutely. so your brother would have been the same he was young yeah he yeah 27 young. with with uh, um yeah. the devil may care attitude most of so, the time so that childlike energy that he had has still has oh that yeah childlike energy kept him in the childlike spirit so I firmly believe having worked in in the end of life with those children is that they're so close to that beautiful spirit energy that child vibrant energy that they're happy they're happy in that place you know adults are, are different they they they're grieving for the family they're leaving behind and the guilt this this is like almost like a, a lever's guilt that they feel whereas a child doesn't have that it's, it's it really is beautiful mm. I know we were talking before about um this kind of fits in I'm good I'm just going to go with the flow with whatever Absolutely. pops in um we were talking about the regrets of the dying weren't we yeah um before we move on to the sort of process of of dying yeah. we were sort of we were talking about that last time and I, I I didn't actually ask you for your comments but I know I asked you to sort of have a think about maybe what are the what are the main sort of regrets maybe of of people when they're dying which can help us live <laughs> Absolutely. And I would say, I mean, I've, I've spoken to so many people or listened to so many people as they as they take their final moments and their biggest regret is they didn't live. That is that is without a doubt the biggest regret. We have this life and we don't live it, you know, and there's there's that, you know, there's lots of analogies and memes and things these days. Isn't there? And it's, you know, um, live every day like it's your last. And we hear of these sayings. 
but they are so true. They are so true. Um, and I think that's that's the biggest thing people say is I wish, I wish I'd, I think for a lot of people and, and generations make a difference as well. So a lot of the older generation, again, were conditioned to be that stiff upper lip and to not, if you show love, you show weakness. You know, if you show tears, you show weakness. And yet for the ones that are living in those final moments, they hear their family say sorry, you know, the word sorry. And again, as a society or a societal norms, the word sorry is seen as a weakness. And yet it's the one thing I hear the most is I'm so sorry. You know, and I, I think for me, that simple word we should use more. You know, so when we do wrong of somebody, even if it's intentional or not, just say sorry. You know, just say sorry with love. Um, so I, I think there's, you know, there's, there's certainly those familiar themes. But th the biggest one is I wish I'd lived. I wish I'd lived without caring what other people think. That's another big one that comes out. Because we care. We care so much. I do myself. I've been trapped in that myself that cycle of caring too much about what the people think about me. And actually at the end of your life, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't matter because those that love us care. Those that are, that, that, you know, that are bullies and negative people around us, they might not like us. That's just tough. That's their business, not ours. You know, and I would hear about these, these sort of, yeah, I wish I'd lived my life without that, that care you know, in, in the most beautiful way. So, yeah, I think that's that's one of the biggest things I, I, I've taken from it is just to live and to say sorry and to say I love you, to say I love you, because, again, certain generations found that hard, you know, certain generations found it hard. If you said I love you, especially a man, you know, a, a man saying I love you is seen as weak. It's like, yeah. wow, wow, where does that come from? What societal norms and conditions place that one upon us? You know, so, you know, that's that's something that children don't have. Children say, I love you. Children say, I'm sorry. Children don't care what other people think about them. You know, they just live. And that's that's the sort of the huge difference I saw in, in that life and death between the both ages as well. Mm. So it's beautiful. Yeah, there's several things in there just from Chris's point of view. I mean, Chris lived his life as he wanted to live it. Good. Certainly did. Certainly lived life to the maximum. Um, and um, the when he when we found what well, Chris and I when we found out that he died, mm. the one I will read you a bit later on in um, when it comes to it. But um, we, he wrote with me. Um, and his main thing was how sorry he was for wow. like the trouble he'd caused. Um, yes. Obviously now we've moved on and it's, it's not a, not a problem, but like mm -hmm. he was so, so sorry. That was what his, his letter was, was yeah. mainly about. Um, yeah. And he also talked about what, what it was like on, on the other side, which we will talk about. Um, yeah. But yeah, the, that, and, and, it, and all these memes that say, you know, live life like it's your last. And it's usually you get that when you've had a near death experience like yourself or you've had, you know, somebody very close to you die and you're like, you've got to grab every opportunity. But I don't know that we do. We we do a lot of talking about it, um, don't we? And if everybody lived like seizing the day and doing what they really yeah. wanted to do, you yeah. might feel you would hurt a lot of people. But actually, in the end, I think everyone would be in a yeah like if you're happy in yourself and you're balanced and you're peaceful in yourself and doing your purpose like you were walking into the hospital and and getting yeah. that job you know life yeah. in general would be a lot calmer wouldn't it for everybody it would be it would be we you know we just we need to stay in our lane don't we we need to stay in our lane and be in your right I, i've just come out of a, a weekend healing festival for healers <laughs> so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm currently i'm sort of sort of overflowing with love at the moment because I've been loved from all angles and yeah. and you know we're 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 creating that in, in certain parts of the UK where we're, we're sort of seeding this new beginning if you like of creating communities again 
you know, because in, in tribes and indigenous tribes around the world, love is what keeps them together. Love is what connects them, you know, and that, that's what we've certainly created this weekend. So, you know, you're right. If, if we're all overfilling with love, that overspills into the people around us and has that sort of accumulative effect. Yeah, mm -hmm. the ripple, the famous ripple effect. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, so if we if we kind of move on, um, so you live like the work, I was going to say you live in between, but the, the work you do, <laughs> you have um, a patient who's who's dying. Yeah. You also have the family who yes. are facing a death like yeah. you are at the it's like an initiation I guess uh, that's yeah. how I kind of see it for both yeah. sides everybody Absolutely. yeah so how if you talk me through can you sort of talk me through your role like yeah yeah I think is, so is that I'll, possible yeah. and I'll sort try. of what the, the sort of process of of what goes on and your sort of he what healing you do yeah okay so the the healing I do is Reiki so I am a, a Reiki master teacher so I teach that and and in the past I've taught Reiki to relatives so after so what death. does Reiki sort of mean on a in a layman's term yeah so Reiki for me is a universal energy it's not affiliated with, with any religion so it, it's a very neutral energy to work with um, and we call it universal life force energy. So it's the energy that exists all around us all of the time. We're all plugged into it from birth. That's our birthright. Some of us are more aware of it than others. Um, so we all have the ability to self-heal. We, we, but we've got that element within us. When you're initiated into Reiki, which is what I do as, as the Reiki master teacher, I initiate people into that place. They then become the self-healer and the healer of others. So there's various different parts to that. So Reiki one is about self-healing and some people will just be Reiki one for the whole of their lives. Others will say, right, Louise, I now want to go and work with others. I want to give Reiki to others. So they come back and do the Reiki two with me. And then if they want to master the experience, they then become a Reiki master through me as well. So there's a whole experience that goes with that. But in terms of working with that end of life care, so when I'm in a room, or in a home wherever I wherever I am with these people, I'm I'm in that space, and as you said, it it's almost holding the hands of both. So it's almost it's holding the hand and the energy of the person who's about to leave, but also holding the space for the family to to be with that. And it's certainly in the the NHS setting, the the family are fully aware that we're present. So often the patient has requested us in, in the past. And often the, the families will say they are so much calmer when they've had Reiki. So can they have Reiki at the end of their life? And that is beyond doubt the biggest privilege ever to be invited into that space, um, especially when I've been invited into people's homes as well, which is even more profound, and even more beautiful. So I'm going to talk about the home because I think that's where it's at. So when people are home in that, that beautiful space of theirs, I will sit with the patient and just hold their energy and I will go to where I'm guided. And when I say guided, you know, it's not some mystical woo woo. It's that just feeling of where does this person want me to hold them right now as they leave? And, and I when you say, a... sorry, when you say holding someone, can you yeah. describe that, what that means? Yeah, of course. So it may be that I literally just hold their feet. It may be that I just hold their feet and just sit with the energy in the physical body and hold them physically. Yeah. Or it might be that I, if, if a particular person is very, um, if the person I'm working with knows about energy and they know about the chakra system, for example, I've worked with people's chakra systems before and worked with their energies and just held their system. Um, and that's probably a whole new conversation because that, that's a whole new realm of itself. So I will go to where I'm guided. So I will either hold them physically, which nine times out of 10 is what I will do. So I will have their, my hand on their body somewhere. It might be the feet, it might be their heart. Very often I feel called to their heart energy because that's where the fear is at the end. So for some people, when they're holding on um, and they're fearful, I'll hold the heart and I'll hold their hand. So I'll, I'll literally hold their heart energy. Um, and I sit with that person and work with healing 
and the person takes that off you. So as a healer, I never profess to go to someone and give healing. The person takes healing from me. I just act as the vessel. It's not an egotistical thing of like, I'm going to give you healing until you pass. It's I'm going to sit here, take what you need until you've left. And that in itself is just a beautiful connection. So I will hold that person's energy. If I have maybe a relative then, and relatives will hold their family, so they'll be holding their hands or holding their head and, and touching them. Sometimes if, the fa if, if a family relative is, is literally close to freaking out and they've, they've got that fear, I'll often hold them at the same time. So what I often do and what I've often done is, is almost act as a bridge between holding the heart of the person who's dying and holding the heart of the person who's left behind. And it's, even if it's just their hand or their heart or their head, wherever that might be, it's just holding until we just equalize the energy between the living. And it's, it's just, I'm smiling because it's just mm. the most incredible experience. It really is. Oh, goodness. I can, I can, I understand that whole, so their level, so they're both in a place of love. Yes, completely. Essentially. So the you fear hold, has yeah. gone. Yeah, you, you hold it till it dissipates because they feel the love and the connection and the healing, both of them do at the same time. And it's a simultaneous feeling of that person calming, the person who's left behind is calming mm -hmm. and the person who's leaving is calming as well. So you're mm -hmm. taking away that fear on both sides. You know, you can't take away grief, but you can certainly work with fear at the end. And I think that's a lot of what my healing is. It, it's balanced in the fear at the end. Okay. And you, describe to me when we chatted earlier about the actual dying process yeah. can you and I know it was one of your first experiences that really well I mean can you can you describe that to, to me now I can yeah so it's one of the most probably profound experiences so it was not that far from my own near death I suppose so it was in in the very beginning of my journey in the cancer center and I was working with a beautiful friend of mine who's still a beautiful friend of mine and um, she had just lost someone herself but she was also one of the healers in the cancer hospital and I had also I can't remember at this stage I think I'd also taught her Reiki as well so we were working with Reiki together and I said well why don't we work with this lady together you know you've just passed your Reiki um, let's do this together let's let's share the experience mm -hmm. and without a doubt it was it was the most profound death I think you know in in all of them because it was my initiation myself into that and I work with the chakra system in in the healing so we work with the seven main chakras there are many more but we work with seven so we work up the body if you like so if you, if you could liken this, and if you could imagine, for those of you that are listening, that the root energy is round about the hips, then you've got the sacral energy, which is round about the waist. Then you move up into the solar plexus, which is um, diaphragm area. Then into the heart, which is where you'd imagine the heart to be. Up into the throat, which is where we express our truth. Then into the third eye on the forehead, um, which is our reality and our imagination. And the crown is at the top of the head. And the crown for me always represents that leaving space. And, and this is what I now know from working here. So the root energy for me is the body energy. It's the physical body that's going to be left behind. So I said to my friend, you hold the crown, which is the place that I felt that they would leave. And I will hold the root, which is the physical body. And one by one, let's just see what happens. And it, we really did open ourselves up to, let's just see where this goes. It was beautiful. And the lady that was passing was such a big part of this. Even though she was no longer verbally communicating with us, her energy system communicated so clearly. This is why I stay doing what I do. So towards the end of life, um, people are often very aware of the noises that the body makes and that can be quite distressing for the family 
So in, in particular, the chest, it's, it's got like a rattling sound to it. And it's not a very nice word, but they call it the death rattle, which is an awful word to use. But it's just where the lung, lungs are no longer, you know, going to, to need to work. So the body does make these, you know, uncomfortable sounds. But the person, I promise you, is not hurting. I can honestly say that because I felt it so many times. So as I held the root energy, it was, it was like little light bulbs sort of flickering. You know, when a light bulb is about to flicker and go. And the root energy did that. And I thought, oh my goodness, it's, it's gone. So I moved up to the sacral energy, which was the next energy center. And the same thing happened again. And it was, it was like almost the, the, the noise that came into my head was almost like a moth hitting the light bulb where you just get those flickers, those flickers of energy. And this light bulb was sort of flickering, you know, making the little sparks and then it would dim and then just go really gently. And then the same for each energy center. Solar plexus did the same. The solar plexus is the seat of our soul. It's our, it's our life force energy. So it's a huge part of us. So that, that took the longest because that, that's mm -hmm. the, the, one of the biggest energy centers that we have. But again, it was just beautiful. And, and you could almost see the colors of the energy system as this was happening as well. So it was, you know, a sort of kaleidoscope of color for us as, as the healers. But for the person, for the lady that was passing, it was such a beautiful feeling of acceptance. And just one by one, these light bulbs just dimmed so, so gently and then just went quiet. But the feeling was one of lightness for her, was one of full acceptance, was relief. You know, for her, it was like, oh, I'm leaving. I'm, go I'm going to the place. I'm going back to my soul energy. You could almost feel her excitement. So she had excitement. She had awe and wonder. And, and yes, she felt the person she was leaving too. She felt that too. But she also felt this acceptance of like, this is okay. I'm fine. And then all of these energy centers closed down. So I then almost didn't have a purpose anymore because I was still in the physical body and my friend had the crown which was ultimately which is the top of the head which is ultimately to me the place of that connection that connection to source to universal energy all around us and she left through there and it was just the most beautiful experience beautiful oh. Goodness, thank you so much for describing it so beautifully. I feel like I'm entranced by <laughs> by you and the and the experience. Um, you also told me uh, I don't mind. Don't know if you want to to explain as well the, the reaction of loved ones when they find it hard to let go. Yes. I know you had a had an experience that you described to me. Would you be able to share that? Also, well, it was the same experience. Yeah. So it's the same person, and without a doubt, was this was this was why it was so beautiful because it taught me how immensely powerful grief is. Because what happened was, as she was leaving and she'd left, we didn't hear anymore her body, so we had almost zoned out completely of her physical being because she'd gone. But what happened, and it, it was it was beautiful and sort of um, shocking all at the same time of, of that transition to hold between life and death. Because as she left, and of course the, the, the breathing had stopped, we were holding her energy with such awe, and we were looking at each other. And I looked at my friends, knowing full well she'd been recently bereaved herself. And I looked at her and just nodded and said, are you okay? Through my eyes, we didn't speak. Are you okay? In other words, do you want me to carry on? Do you want me to hold? And there was this beautiful connection here with us as well. But when the husband heard that she'd gone, he, he screamed. He let out this almost primal scream of grief of, oh my God, she's gone. And as he did that, he was so loud. It shook us all. It literally shook us all. But what it did was it brought her back in back into the physical body with such a jolt I will never forget it 
it was like dominoes falling. You know, when you hit one domino and all the others go down, she sort of almost swiftly came back in, but in, in, a, in, in a shocking feeling. It didn't hurt her, but it was just a feeling of just like, it's, it's okay, I'm still here, I'm still here. And she survived another six hours for him. So he brought her back just for that time. And I've not seen that since. That's extremely rare. Because what I don't want to give is the unrealistic expectation that if you do that, you can bring your people back. You know, because we have to be realistic with grief at the same time. Mm -hmm. But to stand in both of those worlds, for me, was just, wow, the power of physical grief. You know, the power of, of grief to sort of not let go. But she had gone. She was so ready. Mm. And it, it just left us with that feeling of like almost sadness for her that she was so ready to go. But an, an awe for him and an awe at her for just staying that one last moment. You know, and I, I think it was six hours. We weren't there for the, for the final six hours because um, it happened overnight, which was which was for her and for him, you know, and, and then he was able to, to finally let her go because she did, she chose to leave then. Oh, okay. But yeah, that was, in, you know, just to feel that, that jolt back in. Um, but the knowledge as well that she would have gone so peacefully. Mm -hmm. And that's what you normally see, is it? In that's that sort of, that first experience you had, you've seen that replicated again and again, have you? I have done. I, I suppose I have seen that because, you know, not always in that in that direct way. That, that was quite unique because we were part of that experience. Um, but I think certainly the power of grief to... How do I... Ver it's, it's so hard to verbalise some of these things. It really is. I'm, and I'm trying to do it justice by putting it into words. She, ju she was just able to hang on that a little bit longer. Whereas other people I've worked with know when the relatives have left the room. So I also have experience of relatives that, so the person who's passing away doesn't want their relative to see them at those final moments. And I categorically know that the person can also choose to leave. And I've seen that more. I've seen that much more than I've seen that first story. So that first story of, of him pulling her back was quite unusual, you know, um, but the, uh, the other way round is more normal. So we will sit with patients and work with patients and, and often the patient will say, I, I don't want my family to see me die. I don't want them to witness my death. Mm -hmm. And through time, we've, we've often said to people, you will know and you will choose. And that's all we can say because you can't prescribe that for people. So we will often have that, that sense of like, don't worry about it. The, the right thing will happen. But I know for, my, for the people who've gone, the relative will be with them for days. And I mean days at a time. They haven't showered, they haven't brushed their teeth, they haven't eaten a meal. And the nurses will come in and out and say, please go and have a break, but they will stay. And one in particular sticks to my mind. And she would not leave the room with her daughter. And I kept saying to her, you have to nourish yourself first. You have to, because if you're going to say goodbye in the strength that you're going to need to say goodbye, you're going to need to live. And I know that seems a really strange thing to say, but you have to be alive to say goodbye. Mm. Because otherwise you're going to pass out, you're going to be ill, and you're not going to be present. But what often happens then is that that person will go for a shower, they'll go for food, They'll walk down the corridor, they'll get fresh air and the relative will choose to go. And for me, I take huge comfort in that because it's what they want. Mm -hmm. But I know from the relatives I work with and the family that are left behind, the survivor guilt that people feel in that moment, they carry for the whole of their lives. And as the healer, I'm always saying to people, they chose, please don't feel guilty because they chose to go when you were into the room. So please don't have the, don't carry that round like luggage for the rest mm -hmm. of your life. Because trust me, that was divine timing. That was deliberate. 
you might not like that and that might not sit with you. And I'm quite blunt with people because you have to be honest, that will not sit with you. But I'm telling you, that was their choice. So the memory you have of them is living. Ah, okay. Yeah, I get that now. <clears throat> Definitely. So when we we if we now move on to the grieving side, because I know you you have a beautiful quote, which I will let you say about what you think grief is grief is for. <laughs> remind me <laughs> oh the, you said you said it a couple of times actually grief is for us not for them yes absolutely so, yeah you know, the grief we hold can can you sort of I I know you want to say stuff about grief and and how how you know you've seen a good example of grieving um yeah. and, and what your thoughts about grief yeah, so I, again, grief is, is not something we're taught, which I think is wrong. You know, when, when you consider, if we're, if we're being pragmatic, that the only guarantee we have in life is that we're all dying for the minute we're born. Yeah. You know, so that's, I know, I know that's very <laughs> blunt <laughs> and very direct, but it's also very realistic. And I think true. for me, it's very true. And I think, <clears throat> that, I think that we have to learn the cycle of life and death. You know, so certainly for my for my daughter growing up, that this is why, bless her, this is why my daughter had so many animals growing up. Because from a very young age, I wanted to teach her about the cycle of life and death. Because I know that every child goes through a phase of realizing, and the child will, all of a sudden the child will get to a certain age and they're no longer closer to the place they came from. Mm -hmm. they're more in the physical world as they get older and all of a sudden I remember my daughter doing this mum I'm frightened to die and I'm frightened of you dying and it was that, that conversation we all have with young children um but I think the perspective that I've gained from working in that end of life care is that and that's why I can afford to be pragmatic that it is the only guarantee we've got so the way we I think the way we 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 need to approach this going forward is to be taught how to grieve you know to be taught that we have to grieve that we have to let it out that we have to process it you know we also live in a very diverse culturally diverse world and different cultures have different ways of dealing with grief so some cultures will say you know death is a, a much better place so you've got you know, I almost admire sometimes and, and certainly working with different cultures as well, in my experience, mm -hmm. certain cultures will face death with 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 almost an angelic perspective of acceptance and sort of, you know, um, acceptance that this is OK. But we survive in the West, you know, and I keep going back to this because our Western culture is to fear death, is to bottle up the grief is to not feel it is to, is to not process it so I think you know in itself it's it's such a huge subject but I think we need to be realistic and talk about it you know have grief circles that people can come together and sit in circle this is something that I will probably do more of going forward um, is to sit with people and say welcome to the circle let's let's talk let's open up let's share you know so it's I mean it's a huge subject in itself so is is there anything in particular that you want me to touch upon um, it's huge yeah I mean I know I know I well having a missing brother you you have that ambiguous loss so you don't know whether to grieve or not are you obviously are grieving but you don't want to grieve because you, you know he might walk through the door you know there's that that and and that grief got so stuck so my journey was literally facing my grief and actually going through it and I know yes. how frightening it is um yes. so I have complete compassion with anybody who is who like just feels that the grief will just overwhelm them and yes. like how do you even begin I mean what I know how I would do it but how how would you sort of suggest they a sort of first step maybe or a first yeah, way think, to sort of face it yeah I think for me it's it's certainly to surround yourself with people that that's certainly something from, from people I've worked with what people tend to do in grief is to go into themselves 
and they tend to sit with it in a lonely place and I think that's the damage of grief is is that loneliness that that sitting with it and feeling that only you can do this but actually when I look at different cultures and the way different people experience grief sitting in community you know and I don't mean you know rocking up and making a tribe or that you can do that too but I mean it's about it's about being authentic in your grief. So if that means one day you're shouting and you're screaming, then let it come out. So, you know, we're, again, we're, we're so conditioned to hold things in. And that's the one thing I, I want to say is to let it out. Do not let grief sit inside you because the only person that will hurt is you. And I promise you the person that's left does not want that. So it is about expressing it in all of its layers. And that can be raw in the first few days or months or weeks. It can also be a complete numbness. So a lot of it, people I work with experience a numbness that often in, the, and I'm gonna say the first year, I think I spoke to you about this before, mm -hmm. there's an expectation that the first year is the hardest because People say, you know, or oh, there'll be birthdays, there'll be anniversaries, there'll be Christmas, the first Christmas, the first birthday. And what tends to happen then is community arrives for you in that first year, if you're lucky enough. So friends will phone you. It's it's their birthday coming up. What can we do? What, what would you like us to do? And people often put a plaster on it and say, let's take you out and forget about it. But I almost want to say to people, sit with them in that time and instead of saying let's go out and forget about it for the night how about just sit with it with somebody and talk about them you know talk about them and, and just let it out so what I've often found is that the community the community essence of like how are you in the first year can often it's a band-aid it's it's a band-aid fix mm -hmm. it's the second and the third years that are the hardest because that's when people step away that's when people think the first year is done. They'll be okay now. They've had a year. And as you said earlier, Hannah, certainly in our culture, you go back to work. You can't afford to be off with grief. I, I've, I've got a, a dear friend of mine at the moment who's grieving. And she had to be back in work within a week, otherwise she doesn't get paid. You know, so we, we have that conditioning around grief that's just wrong. So for me, I think it's about... A, feeling it in its rawness and sitting with it and not putting a band-aid on it not running from it and escaping and thinking oh I need to keep myself busy so I don't think about this because it's normal to process it's normal to cry it's normal to fall apart at the seams okay but I just want to almost give permission for that to happen yeah, and I think it does, it needs to be, I mean, we talked about this before, we, it needs to be from the ground up, doesn't it? Like, this is how society and culture should be built in. Like, we should have more time off if, you know, a week, how can you possibly go back after a major bereavement? I know people who have, and we've had people, guests on the show who have, and they've literally gone, after an, after a few months, they've just gone, I actually do you know what I, I'm now going to fall apart because I can't hold it any longer yeah. uh, and we need to have it from the ground up a real revision yes. of what grief is and how we hold it in the western society and how we have a community and we all come together yeah. like we've been in a circle in this podcast yeah. for the last six months you know absolutely what springs to mind here it's just come out to me now when we have a child, we have nine months or six months, whatever it is, maternity leave. We birth a child, we have maternity leave. We lose someone, which is the death of someone, and we get a week's leave. We need to, we need to work on this. Yeah. Because death and birth, they're, they're as important as each other in terms yeah. of the, the emotional impact of both of those we, we hold so much reverence, don't we, for birth and, you know, have to have that time off and blah, 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 because it's a beautiful time. Grief is a hard time. It's a difficult time to let go. So why aren't we give it, giving the same amount of time? You know, I'm not saying you should have six months paid leave, but I'm just saying, let's, let's talk about that. 
Mm. Let's talk about that disparity. And I know from from my, we've only got two minutes left, but I know from my point of view, the um, the the people, the spirits that are passed over, they can't mm. sort of connect and communicate if you're in that stuck in that sort of grief cage. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I know we talked about they wait for us on yeah. the other side of our grief. Absolutely. And that's when we can connect and that's when we can, like absolutely. Chris and I have done. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. You know, the time is different for them. It's, it's time for us is a man made construct. Time mm -hmm. for them is the same. So they're still there. They're still there just waiting for us to, to, to almost vibrate at the frequency of love again. And when we. That's we're all it is. Them, that's all it is. Mm -hmm. And that's the birth, the birth and the death that I'm, um, I'm showing it with my hands moving up down like this, like a scale. Um, yeah. And I'm conscious that we're on a radio program, but we've got this scale of, you know, birth is this you know, revered and death is down here. But yeah. actually, they're both about love. Both of them are. Absolutely. Absolutely. And to get that balance. And that's how the communicate. I, I haven't got time now to read the letter, but like that's how Chris and I, that's how it was explained to us. You have to be in balance, both in love. And then without the fear, this fear gets in the way of everything. Um, give, and, give your grief love. Give your grief love. Yeah. And that, love yourself. You. And love Absolutely. yourself in the process of your grieving. Mm -hmm. Don't berate yourself. That's what we do. We berate ourselves. I shouldn't be still upset. I shouldn't mm -hmm. still be grieving. My God, yes, you should. And you can and be grieving for, yeah. And, yeah. and the longer actually you don't accept it, the longer the grief stays there. So you have to yes. let it flow anyway we have run out of time louise oh, oh wow. thank you so much <laughs> thank we covered so much and i hope we everyone did. enjoyed that um you know the show notes will be available tomorrow and, and the transcription um at uh finder of lost things podcast.com so thank you so much louise where can where can anyone find your work give us a quick um yeah sure so um, i'm a little i'm a little bit hidden on social media i'm a bit of a nightmare for it um just because i work with words of mouth so um my my therapy name is um just be therapies online um and my i think my website is louise at wherever you are just be um because i couldn't find a name that was short enough my, my name is just be but um so wherever you are just be.com is uh, is where people can find me but um but yeah just connect with me and you know if i can if i can help anybody certainly in that that process then i will that's what i do with oh, love bless you thank you so much thank you so much louise that was amazing um yeah so that's the oh, it's going to be our last show next week and we have um laura um gardener who was on our first show who actually created our theme tune she's going to be on with me and we're going to do a I look back at all the last six months and try and work out the processes and trying to pull all the threads together. So I'm so looking forward to that. Um, so thank you to Louise and lots of love, everybody. I'll see you next week. Bye. Thank you for listening to The Finder of Lost Things. I think we've been triggered so long and so hard by COVID and it's going to carry on. People are getting used to, to stillness and they're getting used to um, more solitude. But how do you use that time for the highest good? This process that we're going to explore will bring back the joy and purpose to life. That wholeness, you know, that sort of harmony and flow and togetherness. People are really ready to find their lost parts now. You can find me at hannahvelton.online.